Hello, assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all of you. Welcome again on our webinar series. I'm Khushbu Mushtaq, the moderator of the event. And along with me, I have my teammate Imaduddin. And we shall be taking you along with us to the journey of IFRS 18, which is recently launched by the IASB. And uh, the idea of the webinar today is that IFRS 18 is going to replace IAS 1. Yes, IS-1, which was the presentation of financial statements. So IFRS-18 is going to be called as a presentation and disclosures in financial statements. Yes, IFRS-18 is going to be implemented on uh, 1st January 2027. But yes, they have allowed early uh, adaptability. If you would want to uh, adapt it, you can do it. Uh, but again, that depends on your organization. So the idea of today's webinar is that we'll take you through the changes that ISB has launched and uh, what next you need to do if you want to implement IFRS 18. So IFRS 18 is basically going to be implemented on every single entity that prepares financial statements. So no one has the exemption that you don't adopt it or maybe you can get an exemption. That's not possible. So all the entities has to implement this thing. Now let's come to the idea why IFRS 18 was launched or issued. So basically, the use it is only for the users of financial statement to understand the financial statement better. Um, I'll give you a quick uh, research what ISB did. Uh, they took around a sample of around hundred companies or 100 different uh, financial statements, out of which they identified 63 entities were presenting their operating profits differently, which is a huge number, of course. So as an investor, it becomes difficult for an investor or the user of financial statement to compare the financial statements or the company's performances. Um, that was the main reason. It is for the betterment of a presentation, how uh, investors or users will take their decisions based on the financial statements or the presentations. Excuse me. Um, one more thing. There are a few uh, IFRS which will be affected or IS which will be affected by IFRS 18. One of them I can just recall was uh, IS 7, cash flows. Yes, there is a a uh, small change, but uh, there is a change that will come with the IFRS 18 when it will be implemented. A uh, few more areas that uh, can be uh, highlighted are uh, disclosure requirements. So IFRS 18 requires some additional di disclosures in the financial statements for the users. One of them is, uh, you all know, there are many uh, management uh, performance measures like uh, managements are supposed to receive different uh, bonuses, uh, they have their own KPI, KPI, they have their own performance indicators based on some certain factors of the financial statements. For example, EBITDA or EBIT uh, and uh, some adjusted profits, for etc. etc. So, in the financial statements, you must have seen uh, such words being incorporated for the um, management, right? So for an investor, it becomes difficult because they are only seeing the operating profits or net profits on the PNL side. But in other different reports like director reports or other disclosures, they say that bonus has been issued or provided to the company, to the management of the company based on the EBITDA, for example. So as a user or as an investor, it becomes difficult to assess what is the basis and what is EBITDA? Why is it different than my profit that they are disclosing to me? So the idea of IFRS 18 was uh, they want to give a reconciliation as a disclosure in the financial statements that all these uh, management performance indicators or measures uh, they have called in the IFRS and they have made uh, the terminology that they use are management performance measures, which are MPM. So using this MPM, the, uh, the IFRS requires the management as well as the auditors 
to give a disclosure of the reconciliation of these MPMs to the operating profit that is being disclosed in the financial statements. And the auditor is supposed to give uh, their opinion on this MPM as well, or this reconciliation as well. So these are few changes uh, that are being uh, introduced by IFRS 18. Furthermore, Imad can give a better idea. He's here with us. Uh, he's our IFRS geek, as I've been telling in my previous uh, webinars. He has been working with me for a very long time and we have been serving our clients on a uh, very technical IFRS advisory as well. So Alhamdulillah, we are a good team. And uh, the idea of today's webinar is just to take you through with these new presentation and disclosure uh, requirements that are being launched in IFRS 18. And uh, one more thing that is very important. So once you adopt IFRS 18, you have to present your comparative periods in the same way you are being presenting your current period, which means the changes will have a retrospective impact. Yes, retrospective means all the presentations and all the disclosure that you are uh, presenting in current year financial statement, the same impact, the same changes, the same reconciliation you have to prepare for the previous financial statement. This is one more thing that will affect uh, the hard work of the management as well as the auditors. So um, I think that is all from my side. We can take it forward with all the uh, minute details that the IFRS has issued. So Imad, let's take it forward. And uh, Thank you everyone for uh, uh, such a great feedback. We have been receiving uh, excessive appraisal from all of you and uh, all the audience, all the attendees. Uh, we are very grateful. Thank you for joining us and let's continue. Thank you very much, Kushpu, for this wonderful summary of IFRS 18 and the introduction you provided. It really highlighted all the key changes that have occurred um, in IFRS 18. So the webinar is itself designed to focus on all the key changes itself. So it's not we are not going to repeat what IIS 1 already had and IFRS 18 continues. Uh, so there are a lot of things that IFRS 18 takes from IS1 just as almost just as they were. But there are some very unique and interesting changes that IFRS 18 offers. Uh, so here's our agenda for today's webinar. We have already gone through the introduction to IFRS 18. Now we look into roles, aggregation, and labeling. Uh, what that is, that's basically all that is in the final statements. Uh, this would define or dictate the structure of how and what we present in financial statements. And then we'll go through some key changes that have been introduced in income statement, which is very easy to understand, but uh, sometimes in practice, you will have to know a lot more to classify uh, expenses and income in the right categories. And then there's management defined performance measures. What are these? Uh, we'll, we'll look deep into them, but rough for now, you should understand that you need to now incorporate your MPMs, which have been narrowly defined by the IFRS 18. And you have to incorporate them as a single note in the financial statements. Previously, companies used to, uh, used to um, report them in their annual reports, but outside of audited statements. But now they will have to be included within the audited financial statements. So these are some very interesting changes. Now look at how IRF, now again, just like all the other IFRS, IFRS 15, IFRS 16, all the recent IFRSs, which have changed uh, from more rule-based accounting to more conceptual accounting, the same uh, practice have been used in IFRS 18 as well. So to define the entire structure of financial statements, IFRS 18 has resorted to some very basic concepts. And one of the most fundamental concepts is the role. What exactly is role? First, let's define uh, some of the terminology in, in IFRS 18. So when you look at financial statements, there are statement of financial position, we have income statement, we have statement of other comprehensive income, we have statement of cash flows, and we have the notes. Now, uh, uh, IFRS 18 says uh, the first four, or anything, all of these other than the notes, are the primary financial statements. This is where the line items are presented. And then we have notes for providing additional information about those line items. 
So line item, the word line item also has a very strict definition. Line item only appears on the primary function statements. Anything that appears in nodes is not a line item. It's just an item, right? Uh, okay, now the structure of the function statements now will be defined by roles, characteristics, and materiality. What you disclose, where you disclose, and how you disclose will be uh, defined by these three factors. Roles, characteristics, and materiality. So what exactly are roles? Uh, Atimia has raised hand. If if you I, if you can wait till the Q and A session till the end, it will be really great for us. But if you have something urgent, please uh, let us know. You can write in the chat or ask us to unmute. If I can do that. Uh, I think Atif, you can just write your Q question in the Q and A section, please, so that we can. Uh, respond accordingly. Thank you. All right. Now the rule, there are two things, obviously. There is a primary file statement and there are notes. The role of the, first we look at the role of the primary file statement. And the role of the primary file statement is to provide useful, structured summaries of the reporting entities, assets, liabilities, equity, income, expense, and cash flows. Now this concept of Useful structure summary is a new one. It was not there in IS1. Now, what do you mean by useful? Uh, now, this uh, the, the primary file statement should provide a structure summary that are useful to the users so that they can obtain an understandable overview. Which means the purpose of the primary file statements is to only obtain an understand, understandable overview so that they can get an overview and they can understand rightly what they are seeing, right? Uh, and then secondly, making comparisons. Now these comparisons can be between uh, entities of the same industry, or they can be comparisons with the same entity in the previous years. And then identifying items for seeking additional information. So some items might be straightforward and there might be some, some line items for which uh, users might want additional information. So the final statement, let's say income statement should be structured in a way that it provides useful structured summary uh, and useful for what? For obtaining an understandable overview of the income of the company, income expenses, uh, making comparisons with other companies and its own income expenses and identifying items for seeking addi additional information. So there are, if there are, for example, other finance expenses, they might want to obtain other more information about uh, such items. Uh, we'll more talk, uh, IFRS 18 also speaks about, I'm a little, a little excited about these new concepts because these are going to be, you know, have a lot of implications um, in the future. Uh, but let's say uh, even the, the, uh, the, the word other that is, is very frequently used in a lot of financial statements have been restricted in IFRS 18. You can, you have to try to use some other description in a line item other than the word other itself. So we'll go into it uh, separately. Okay, and what exactly is the role of the note? The role of the notes is to provide material information. Again, if it's immaterial, it's not the role of the note to describe everything in the company that's immaterial, right? The role of the notes is to provide material information, material disaggregation. To understand line items and to supplement the primary financial statements with additional information, right? Very straightforward. So we have the basic role in the primary financial statement to get a structured summary, which enables users to get an understandable overview. And then in the in the notes, we want to go into detail, want to supplement the financial statement with additional, additional information, but additional material information. And so this would allow the users to understand the line items. Uh, for example, if there is a line item, admin expenses, this might include payroll costs. This might include some other rentals, uh, uh, office rent, all these things. So to, to better understand the admin expenses, you would need notes to understand what material information is there. Now, here's an example. 
And this is an interesting example. So there are some line items required within uh, IFRS 18 and within also some other standards. And for example, IFRS 9 requires provision uh, to be provided as a line item uh, in some cases. So, but the board concluded that an entity is not required to present such line items in one of the primary financial statements if those line items are not necessary for the statement to provide a useful structure summary. Right? So even, even if those line items are specifically required by some standard, they might not be presented if they are not relevant to providing a useful structure summary. So this is how dominant this, this concept is, right? You can actually override an explicit requirement to present a line item if it does not provide useful structure summary. Now, most interesting thing is this is a very vague concept. It's a very judgmental concept. Yeah. Uh, I say that there are kind of judgments. There are certain judgments which are very clear. We can you can make it uh, very easily, but there are certain judgments for which there could be a lot of possible answers. So a lot of possible formats can provide useful structure summary, and so you have to apply the judgment and you have to you know agree with the auditors about that and go ahead with the one which you think provides the most useful structure summary. So similarly, uh, let's take an example of uh, restructuring, right? Should we uh, include restructuring as a separate line item in the primary five statement? For example, in income statement, can I write separately restructuring expenses? So th the answer is it depends. Whether to provide a line item for restructuring in the statement of power loss, the entity needs to consider whether such a line item contributes to a useful structure summary. So it's a very open-ended answer. It's not a definitive answer for all of these. Let's say restructuring expenses are significant, right? They're not just material, they are significant. And they, pro they provide why the, they answer the question of why the operating expenses have increased so much. In that case, providing them separately on a line item would, would uh, would provide users a useful structure summary to get an overview of the company, right? So it's, it would be an, an understandable overview to to uh, to see the, the rest significant restructuring expenses on the income statement so that I can compare this. Again, useful structure summary uh, has to be in the context of comparison with other companies and its own past performance. So if the performance of the company has reduced and it's because of restructuring expenses, to get an overview of that, I should see that separately. But let's say restructuring expenses are less than 2% of the total expenses. Uh, or they have been depreciated, some, uh, or amortized. Some of those were capitalized and now they have been um, they, they are being amortized for some reason. Uh, they would not be significant enough to maybe uh, to, to be separately presented to provide a useful structure summary. So you understand the idea? Uh, these the, the line items should be the pillars of what is going on inside the company, right? Now, we've gone through the rules. Now let's talk about characteristics. Initially, we said all our financial statements were structured based on roles, characteristics, and materiality, right? Now look at the characteristics. Uh, some items can have different characteristics than other. For example, nature, such as depreciation, is different from uh, amortization, which is different from employee benefits, right? Uh, function, uh, admin expenses are different from marketing expenses. Marketing expenses are different from production ex expenses. Measurement basis, size. So sometimes there might be slight different characteristics, but the size of the two items might be so big that they might have to be disaggregated. Now, when we talk about characteristics, we are talking about characteristics in the context of aggregation or disaggregation which means should we divide a line item into two or should we keep a single line item? Again, this is judgmental. To apply the concept of characteristics to define what line item should be there or even if it's inside the note, what information should be uh, material enough to be disclosed separately uh, and not clubbed into other items, it's important. So for example, trade receivables. If trade receivables are all the same nature, uh, so we do not have to, you know, disaggregate that information based on what industry we are providing the receivables to, right? Let's say we are selling um, 
uh, a, a very common word like laptops. We don't need to worry about which industry we are selling it to, and we don't need to disagree that which because the characteristic of that of that particular item is all the same. These are receivables. But let's say there are two kinds of receivables. One is uh, receivables without financing component, and the others are receivables with financing component. Now there is a difference in characteristics. And so the judgment would be required uh, as to whether we want to disaggregate those receivables in the nodes or not. Now here's, a, again, a very conceptual presentation of how this should look like. If there are less characteristics that are common, then we are more likely to disaggregate that information. And if there are more characteristics that are common, we are more likely to club or group that information and we are going to present that information in aggregation. Think about it in terms of sales revenue. If you say all your sales revenue comes from a single kind of product or single kind of segment, you might not need to uh, break it in, in terms of top 10 customers in your, in your notes. Uh, but if you have three different products and all of the, them are producing revenue, then you might need to break them up inside your nodes because uh, the characteristics is different. All right, the source of those revenue is different. Now have a look at this. This is a very uh, you know comprehensive yet, yet um, concise example as to how we would use characteristics to structure our income statement. Now this section is not uh, specifically on income statement. We'll go deeper into that. But let's say we want to decide what line items to add in our income statement. So we'll first of all, let's say these are the expenses. We have cost of sales. We have human resources, we have legal expenses, we have accounting expenses, we have commissions, and we have marketing cost. Should we keep them just the way they are, or should we try to group them in some way? Okay. We have to first of all look at the role of the primary fine statement. What is the role? To provide a useful structured summary that enables the users to get an understandable overview. Now, even if we uh, put all the uh, all the expenses separately, this would provide an overview, but that won't be a useful structure in some way. So this is, you know, kind of optimal point we're trying to find how much aggregation or disaggregation would there be. Now look at this. One way would be to classify all of these expenses, human resource, legal and accounting into admin expenses and commission and marketing costs into selling expenses. Why? Because they have similar characteristics. So the concept of characteristics is tied with the concept of useful structure summary. When three items, let's say human resource, legal, and accounting have the similar characteristics, which means it would enable to provide uh, which means clubbing them would provide a, a more useful structured summary. So let's say we can club them, all of them, into admin expenses. Similarly, commission and marketing costs uh, all belong to selling expenses. Their nature is related to marketing and selling, right? So we can have this kind of summary in the income statement, or maybe we can uh, club them even more. We can, we can group them even more and just provide two items of expenses, cost of sales, and admin and selling expenses, right? In this case, maybe we are we are aggregating too much information, too much dissimilar information into a single line item, right? And again, you can see that this is very judgmental. Or alternatively, what we can do is we can club all of the items into single operating expenses. So sales less operating expenses equals operating profit. And so, in most cases, the most useful structure summary would be in case B, where you have items expenses that have similar characteristics that are clubbed and item expenses that have dissimilar characteristics that have been separated. So dissimilar characteristic items have not been clubbed. So this would not be the best or most suitable way uh, that can agree with the role of the financial statement, which is provide the most useful structure summary. And 
Finally, materiality is, is our old friend for the auditors and accountants. Uh, it doesn't go away. It cannot go away, apparently. And so aggregation and this aggregation should not obscure material information. So if there's some material information that users should know, and if they knew it, they, it would affect their decision-making, that kind of information should not be hidden behind aggregation, right? And if that item if that kind of disaggregation does not allow a useful structure summary uh, on the primary final statement, then that information should be disclosed or disaggregated in the notes to the final statements. And so again, we have to look at the role of both of these things, the role of the primary financial statements and the role of the notes when deciding whether to disaggregate or separate or disclose the information in the line item or inside the notes. And so you can see that again, uh, in this standard as well, IFRS has, has successfully developed, you know, a framework, a conceptual framework where, uh, which can guide the development of fine statements, the structure of, of the, of each of the primary fine statements and, and the structure and disaggregation within the notes. Now, IFRS 18 also provides some guidance on labeling that was not there in IS1. And the labeling should provide users with enough information to understand those items. So the purpose of labeling is to understand what those items really are. So if there is some misleading labeling or some lab labels that uh, you know does not serve any purpose in helping the user understand what those items are, such kind of labels should not be allowed. So entities are required to label and describe items in a way that faithfully represents the item and provides users with the necessary description and explanations to understand those items. So let's say some, some labels are not self-explanatory. In that case, you will have to provide additional descriptions and explanations to explain what those items are. So again, the purpose is communication. The purpose is to tell your story to your investors, to your stakeholders. And so to do that, you will have to you know, make sure that the labels you are using are understood in the same meaning as you are trying to say. Like you cannot just try to mislead your users by by providing a slightly less appropriate label uh, in a way that you want to hide something inside some line items. So again, materiality has to be respected and understandability has to be respected. Now it's very common practice to label a lot of items as other and so as IFR Edin says, labels should be informative. And if you just write other, it provides no additional information. So what should entities try to do? Um, if such uh, a line item or such an item within the notes comprises of a material item and other immaterial items, <clears throat> then maybe you can think of labeling it as the only material item, which might you know, provide at least some information as to what those expenses are. The other thing that we can do is we can try to go a step further and try to uh, label them as precisely as possible. So for example, rather than just saying other expenses, we can divide them into other operating expenses and other finance expenses. That would be a better way of presenting something. And so this provides in the disaggregated information in the notes, it was material. Now, just like IS1, IFRS 18 also provides specific line items. So for example, in the balance sheet, we have to provide at least these items. So if there's a goodwill, you have to provide it. If there's an intangible asset, you have to present it as a line item. All these items need to be presented separately, right? Uh, but again, if, for example, those items contradict with, with the idea of providing useful structure summary, uh, you are not required to disclose those mission, and but you should disclose that in the notes, not in the primary file statements. Okay, maybe we can have some questions. If uh... so, we have already a question regarding materiality. All For right. instance is material to the shareholder, but management does not perceive it as such. How should that disclosure should be handled? So basically, yes, I totally understand 
the perspective of management is quite different than the usual shareholders. So anyway, it is again, uh, as per my idea, it should be as a management, it is your responsibility to make sure to provide the maximum disclosures to your uh, audience, to your stakeholders in assessing to the level that they shall be expecting. And that is the actual purpose of this IFRS. Your presentation and your disclosure should be as simple or as concrete so that it becomes the information becomes usable for your investors, for your stakeholders. Materiality again depends on you. Uh, as an auditor, I can advise you different areas or different ideas how to assess your materiality. But again, you need to think from the perspective of the shareholder as well that whether this uh, expense or your uh, transaction shall be material, will this have an impact on your shareholders' decision in one way or the other? It again depends. It's very judgmental materiality concept when we studied, when we were like very little, very young, when we started our careers, like Imad said. Uh, it's our oldest friend, I would say. So it again depends on you uh, as the management. You need to disclose everything to an extent that becomes uh, usable for the stakeholders. Uh, Imad, would you like to share anything? Yeah, sure. So the purpose of the financial statements is not uh, to present it to the management. Again, we are doing financial reporting. This is external financial reporting. This is not internal financial reporting, right? They're not management reports. So it doesn't matter what management thinks. What really matters is what our stakeholders expect from these. What, see, in a company, we have, dude, we are not managing our own money. If it's a public company, we are managing other people's money, right? We are managing the business uh, basically owned by shareholders, right? And they have the right to know what's going on in the company. And therefore, if something, if they would know would, would affect their decision making, they should know it. And that's the purpose of the concept of materiality. Uh, that it affects the decision making of the users. So if you, uh, so again, the entire concept of maturity is from the point of view of the stakeholders, not from the point of view of the management. So uh, I think it should be not just, we should not look in, uh, like materiality is, is the kind of information that is necessary to provide. I think management should try to provide even more information that helps the investors to be to feel that they know everything about the business that they need to know um, because they they particularly have that right to know. Uh, thank you, Imad. Uh, the next question is that uh, is there any change in the presenting specific line item under the IFRS 18 or is it similar to IS1? Almost similar. There are some differences in some statements, but almost for some of these, it's almost similar. Uh, so basically, IS, sorry, IFRS 18 is not going to change the recognition criteria, the treatments, everything will be same, but yes, some of the presentation might change. Uh, I would not say change. It is an add-on on, on, uh, on what we are already doing. So if you can see what's uh, what how we have been presenting the income statement, uh, now Imad will uh, tell us. Uh, some changes, some uh, additional things that we need to do, some bifurcation, some uh, reclassification maybe. And it's, actually they have given us a clear path on what to do. Like I remember, I have seen many financial statements from the cash flow side. So people start their cash flow from profit and loss. Some people start their cash flow from operating loss. Uh, so there is no consistency and it is not even mentioned anywhere as of now. But IFRS 18 has given us clear guidelines that how to start your cash flow. So now it is a rule you have to follow and it becomes easy for everyone and it will be consistent. And again, for a user, it will be very important to have the similar uh, information received from all the financial statements they, they are being investing. So the user that I, we have been talking about, it will not only be uh, investors. It can be anyone who is reading the financial statement. It could be your research analyst. It could be your journalist. It can be the you know extend extensive family members of the investors. Whoever reads your financial statements become your user, not only the investors. So you as a management um, needs to make sure 
that your user uh, is comfortable with the financial statement. They should have a reliance on your financial statement. And I think IFRS 18 has given us a very clear path and made our lives easier rather than we think how to start our cash flows, for example, or how to present the financial statement with respect to the aggregations, or what items should be classified, what items can we club. They have given us clear guidelines to this. That's it. Okay, the third question, any penalization if we are not following um, the... Okay, any penalization to the management or the judgment clause with respect to materiality provides an escape to the management. Penalization, I would not say. Uh, your financials will go to your auditor. They will assess whether you are presenting the financial statements in the true and fair view. And if they are not uh, comfortable, they will not give you clear opinion. Okay, next question. If the commission oh. cost is immaterial, you, would you like to take it? Yeah, Come sure. On. Yeah. So if the commission cost is some material like 2.5% of sales, then as for the nature, we can't avoid it. Can we club it in the cost of sales rather than separate line item in selling expenses? Do we still have to provide disclosure on this? Uh, first of all, 2.5% of, of sales would not be considered immaterial in most cases. So it would be material. Uh, even then, if let's say, even the, if it's material, you cannot... Uh, you should not club it into cost of sales, rather you should be clubbing it with sales to provide more useful assembly in most cases. And third is, do we still have to provide disclosure uh, on this? Obviously, if it's material, you would have to provide disclosure. If it's immaterial, let's say like 0.01% of sales, you might not even need to disclose, disclose it because it would not be expected to affect the decisions of the users of financial statements. But again, I think it depends on the type of business. What is your business actually? If it is like something that your sales is dependent on your commission, then you have to disclose that thing. And if it is not dependent, like for example, it is a, just a, an add-on to your sale, then you can even think about it, whether you have to disclose based on the materiality. Again, materiality is very subjective. Uh, you need to think all the odds and then decide. And you have your auditors with you, your consultants who are uh, giving the guidance on different industries at the same time. So they know how people in different industries in the market are doing. They can advise you better. Uh, okay. Next question is statement of comprehensive income will be presented separately and not as an extension of income statement. I think the next question, uh, next area that Imad is come covering, you can get your answer. With. Sure. Yes, Imad. Let's continue. Thank you, everyone, for the questions. Yeah. As far as the structure of uh, income statement is concerned, I think both presentations are possible in, inside FRS 18. So you can present it separately, and or you can <clears throat> edit a single statement with all the comprehensive income. That would not be a big deal. All right, but what exactly is the difference? Uh, what is IFRS 18 requiring from the entities now? First of all, it requires classification of income and expenses into five categories, right? And so three of these categories are new based on the main business activities. Now, what exactly are these categories? We'll go through these. So we now have to look at which expense relates to which category, and we have to carefully categorize it. Now, this is non-trivial. This is something that a lot of businesses would be impacted by. And you will have to see carefully whether your income or expenses are going into your operating expenses, operating activities, or operating segment, or in the uh, investing segment or in the financing segment. And then we also have to present a newly defined operating profit and other subtotals on the face of the statement. So I first 18 also introduces new subtotals. Now it has required additional categories and it has required additional subtotals on the face of the income statement. And like the previous uh, IS, IS1, it allows us to present operating expenses by function, by nature, or on a mixed basis. Now this is very strange. In IS1, there was not an explicit allowance or explicit uh, 
statement which said you can do it on a mixed basis. But now we are being told that you can structure your income statement based on function, based on nature, or on a mixed basis. We'll go into deeper into this uh, in a bit. So this is how uh, IFRS 18 would would structure or would uh, affect the income statement. So if, for example, if you were previously only uh, categorizing your operating expenses and income by nature, now you have the option to do it by a function or on a mixed basis, whatever basis provides a useful structured summary of your income expenses. All right, so one of the categories that IFR that introduces. So for, to enable the users to understand where the income expenses are coming from, what are the nature of the sources, IFRS 18 requires us to break our income expenses into, first of all, three categories, uh, which are operating category, investing category, and financing category. Uh, this, is, uh, this is very similar to a uh, cash flow statement, but the, it's not identical, and we'll talk about it. So income and expenses from entities, main business activities and income expenses that are not classified in other categories. So operating category is what the business is really doing is the main business activity. And that's what they're trying to, uh, that's where they're trying to earn money from. Investing category is where businesses invest. And that investment is largely independent from the entity's main business activities. So if I sell plastic products and am I investing in, in, a, in, an, in an investment property to earn money from there, then investment property might not be my main business activity. My main business activity would be selling plastic products. And so uh, users of the final statement should know that a portion of my income is coming from something that is unrelated to the main business activity. And that's the purpose of categorizing it separately. Similarly, we have financing category, income expenses relating to obtaining finance to fund the entity's main business activities or investing activities, right? So these are income and expenses that result from obtaining finance and those finances are used to fund the business's main business activities. Now this income tax category which includes the tax expense or the tax income and any related foreign exchange differences. So foreign exchange differences are a story on its own. They can go into several different categories uh, and we have to classify them uh, appropriately. And then there is a discontinued operation category uh, which was already there because income expenses from discontinued operation were required to be separately provided. Now, because we have all these different categories, we have a subtotal after every single category. After operating category, we have the operating profit. After investing category, we have a subtotal of profit before uh, finances and tax. After financing category, we have you know profit after before tax and this kind of operation, and then after tax as well. So these are the new categories and subtotals that have been introduced by IFRS 18. Uh, Imad, I think your camera is off. We would like to see you as well. Uh, I think uh, my charging is over. <laughs> so that would be a problem. Should not be a big deal, I guess. Thank you. We are going to miss you. <laughs> <laughs> I think all these webinars cannot be proceeding without any technical issues. So. Mm, true. <laughs> all right. Please continue. Anyways, so when we have to categorize all the income and expenses on the basis of main business activities, we should also be able to understand what our main business activity is, right? And for some, investing might be the main business activity. And for some, providing finance might be the main business activity, right? And so if a company is doing any of these two things, Either it is, it, is, it is investing in particular types of assets or it is providing financing to customers, then it will have to assess whether these are the main business activities of that company, right? It has to make an additional assessment. Why? Because if 
the company has these activities as the main business activities, uh, they will have to classify income expenses from these investments and these financing into their operating category and not in investing and financing category, right? So if, for example, I invest in uh, in a lot of um, shares and financial assets as my main business activity, then it would not be my investing activity, it would be my operating activity, right? So classification is based on what my main business activity is. So any company, for example, is, has some, let's say, investment properties, and it, it marks a significant proportion of its revenue, it will, it will have to reassess whether it is its main business activity or not. Now, we talked about investing in certain particular types of assets and providing financing to customers. Why are we talking about these things? Because these things are more common in things in companies like banks, insurers, investment property companies. So these are the companies where the main business activities are different as compared to other, such as manufacturing companies. And so their classification will be different. And we talked about investing in particular types of assets. What those types of assets are? Okay, and what are those main business activities? How do we assess it? So it's not an assertion. Let's say a company can not say that I consider this to be my main business activity. And despite the fact that I have 25% of revenue from here, I don't consider this the main. And that's my, my aim or my goal or my ambition is to, to keep the main business activity and to not worry about, uh, let's say, investment properties, even if they provide 40% of the revenue. So that assertion does not matter because main business activity should be a statement of fact, what's going on in the business, what is really the main business activity of the business. And so the judgment would have to be made based, not based on the entities or management's assertions, but based on the individual facts and circumstances of that company. And if, for example, we, we provided two different categories, investing in assets, and providing financing to customers. If a company does any of these things as the main business activity, then it discloses this fact. So we have to make a special disclosure that these activities are the main business activities so that users should know that they need to find, they would find income expenses related to those activities in the operating section or the operating category rather than investing category. Now there could be companies that provide uh, that have more. They may have more than one business activity. For example, uh, a company that manufactures a product, let's say home appliances, and provided financing to customers. So let's say that particular business also sells home appliances on higher purchase or on leases, which means uh, that that particular business have two particular main business activities. It's also manufacturer and it also provides financing to customers. And so any any income expenses from providing those finances to customers would be included in the operating segment and not in the investing segment. So we talked about, again, we talked about these two aspects, investing in specified assets and providing financing to customers. So what those assets are? Have a look at this. These uh, kind of asset investments is where we have to assess whether the main business activity is investment or not. First, investment in associates, joint ventures, or unconsolidated subsidiaries not accounted for under the equity method. So if investment in associates, joint ventures, or unconsolidated subsidiaries are accounted for under the, the equity method, then you do not have to make that assessment. But if these uh, investments are not accounted for under the equity method, that you, then you have to assess. And we'll see why is that the case. And other non-operating expenses, for example, debt or equity investments, investment in properties, and re rent receivables from the properties. So any op non-operating ex 
investment in any non-operating assets is also likely to be an investment activity. And if your main business activity is investing in those non-operating assets, including financial assets, then you would have to assess whether these are your main business activities. So investment property companies invest in non-financial assets. Insurers invest in financial assets. So both of them have these investments as main business activities. And so expenses and income from these activities would be categorized as in their operating category. Now here's a really good chart, a really, really good uh, decision table to understand what the uh, treatment would be. So let's say your company invests in associates, joint ventures, or unconsolidated subsidiaries. So we have to first look at whether it is accounted for under the equity method. If it is accounted for under the equity method, you have to classify it in, is it in investing category, which means irrespective of what is your main business activity, if your investment is accounted for under the equity method, you don't have to worry about it. You have to simply classify it in investing activities, even if you do it as your main business activity. But if it is not accounted for under equity method, you will have to see whether this is your main business activity or not. If such investment is not your main business activity, you have to account for it in the investing category. Otherwise, you have to account for it or classify it in the operating category. And so there's a lot of such decisions you have to make in the process of, uh, you know, when you would, you would be uh, transitioning to IFRS 18 as to which of your items, what your main business activity are, is, and what kind of, uh, what kind of investments you have and whether to classify those expenses and incomes into operating category or into investment category. If you have a lot of investments in cash and cash equivalents, you do not have to assess whether you invest in them as the main business activity, right? So here is you know, a broader picture of other assets which are non-operating, right? So just to revise what you just saw, let me take you back. When we talk about specified assets, okay, when we talk about, uh, you know, main business activities, we have to isolate two different categories, investing in specified assets and providing finance to customers. Now, within investing in a specified assets, we have two further categories, investment in associated uh, joint venture or unconsolidated subsidiaries not accounted for under the equity method and other non-operating expenses. So we have gone through the decision tree for investment uh, for these investments but we still have to go through the decision tree for non-operating expenses. So if we invest in operating expenses, operating assets, for example, property, plant, equipment, trade receivables, any expenses would go through the operating category without a doubt. So any impairment on your trade receivables would go into your operating category. Any deposition on property, plant, equipment, because they are your operating assets, it will go into your operating category. But when we invest in non-operating assets, we have to look at what's going on. First, investment in joint ventures and unconsolidated subsidiaries. We have always seen that if they are accounted for in the equity method, we have to classify them as invest, um, investment category. But if we are, if they are treated as other than equity method, we have to see whether this is our main business activity. If it is not our main business activity, the income expenses from these kind of investment would go into investing category. And if they are our investing category, indeed, the income expense would go into operating category. Now, the other non-operating ass assets, which is the other classification, for example, financial assets, uh, investment property. If you have investment in these, whether you have investment in these as your main business activity or not, if you have it as your main uh, business activity, for example, if you invest in financial assets, shares and bonds as your main business activity, then income and expenses from these investments would go into your operating category. But if you are only holding these financial assets such as uh, in shares and bonds from your 
you know, excess cash te on temporary basis, which is you're not your main business activity. In that case, any income expense from those non-operating assets would go into investing category. Now we have a cash and cash equivalents, which every company holds. So we have to have a diff different kind of look at it. Does the entity invest in financial assets as the main business activity? If yes, then it would go into operating category without any doubt, right? But if no, then we have to look at whether the entity provides financing to customers as a main business activity. If it's no, it will go to investing category because any income from financing customers uh, would be not be its main activity activity and would be an investing activity should, should categorize should be categorized as such. But if the entity provides financing to customers as the main business activity, we have to see whether cash and cash ac equivalents are related to financing, providing the financing or not related to provide the, providing the financing. If let's say the company holds cash and cash equivalent that are not related, they're related to providing financing and it is the main business activity, then it would go into operating category. Understand we're talking about, we're talking about providing financing to customers. And with as, as a function of that, we might have some cash and cash equivalents. They might be related to it. They might not be related to it. If financing to customers is the main business activity, and so the related cost may also be the main, related cash and cash equivalents may also be related to the main business activity. And so the cash and cash equivalents related to the main activity, uh, which is providing finance to customers, should actually go into investing category, but the standard provides an accounting policy choice. So you can provide it in both operating category as well as investing category. But if cash and cash equivalents are not uh, related to providing finance to customers. And despite the fact that is the main business activity uh, to provide financing, it would still go into operating category. So if you go through it two or three times, you would have a very good picture of this entire structure of investment from income and expenses. Uh, sorry, the categorization of income expenses from these investment in operating assets as well as non-operating assets. So, I think this chart should also make it very clear that the effects that I for would have are non-trivial. They would affect a lot of, a lot of companies and a lot of, a lot of companies have, will have to make a lot of assessments. And because cash and for cash and cash equivalent, we always have an option to categorize in, it in operating category. Uh, we do not need to specifically assess uh, whether we, we invest in cash and cash equivalents as a main business activity because we still have the option. So therefore we, there's no mandatory assessment. But if we are investing in these two categories, investment in associates, joint ventures, and unconsolidated subsidies, other negative methods, and other non-operating assets, for these two categories, we have to assess whether these are our main business activities. Now, what happens if we reassess? Let's say we um, the structure of a company or business has changed. We have evolved into a different kind of company. And uh, of maybe our assessment previously was wrong. If we reassess our main business activities, then we have to apply that reassessment or the effect of that reassessment prospectively. So we do not have to reclassify the amount for change because reassessment is always prospective. Now, not all the expenses and come from, let's say, investing activities. Assuming you you do not have any of those investment in non-operating assets as your main business activity, which means everything from those activities should go into your investment category. Even then, not all the expenses would go into the investing category. Uh, so, so the extent to which uh, as expenses and income can be categorized into, let's say investing categories are is based on whether those expenses arise on initial and subsequent measurement of the property or incremental expenses that are directly attributable to the acquisition and disposal. So any expenses that are directly attributable 
arise because of the measurement of those prop debt property, those expenses should go into investing category. All of the expenses should go into still go into operating categories. And let me give an example here. So let's say you you have investments in in the in an investment property, let's say you own a building and you rent it out, it is not your main business activity. So all the income expenses from that particular building should go into uh, your investing category. But let's say you have some people in the payroll, some employees, uh, which are managing the accounts, which are managing the recoveries and income expenses arising from those uh, employees costs should not be categorized into uh, investing activities that should be categorized as operating activity. Similarly, uh, entities that provide finance to customers as the main business activity cl classify income expenses in the operating category rather than the financing category. We have talked about it, such as providing financing to customers. Uh, let's say just the example we discussed was the higher purchase or sale of home appliances by the manufacturer. And as we all already talked about any cash and cash equivalents that we have uh, associated with those financing liabilities, uh, then we have a policy choice. We can either, if those cash and cash equivalents relate to providing financing, and we can either categorize them as investing activity or categorize them as uh, operating activity. Now for foreign exchange differences, we have some complication. The, the, the ideal objective is to classify foreign exchange differences in the same category as the income expenses from the items that gave rise to them. This is the basic principle. So if let's say an item that gave rise to foreign exchange differences was receivables, any foreign exchange gain losses on receivables should go into operating category because that's an operating item. But if let's say foreign exchange differences arise from an investment, the changes in foreign exchange should go through the, uh, into the investing activities. But sometimes there might be more component in a single item. Right. So let's say you have receivables and you provide financing to them. And this might be a mixture of investing activity and an operating activity, then you might have to divide or, or classify foreign exchange differences from a single item into two different categories, investing and operating, which might become really complex. So I find the team uh, provides us, a, you know, a, a lenience over here. In accordance with IFRS 18, if classifying foreign exchange differences in the same category as the income expenses from items that gave rise to them would involve undue cost or effort, then an entity classifies the affected foreign exchange differences in the operating category. Right? So if it's confusing, if you have to, it involves undue cost and effort to identify where those uh, foreign exchanges differences came from, we have to categorize those foreign exchange differences in the operating category. Now here's a complete uh, decision tree when deciding where to categorize foreign exchange differences. So you see, when we introduce these categories, operating, investing, and financing, we now have to classify everything into these three. So there's if you have items that go into more than one, or you have considerations close to being investment, investing activities and financing activities, you would have to look at them closely. And you know, you know it would the effect would not be trivial. Your income statement would be different and you will have to assess all of your activities in order to classify your items correctly. I think auditors should also learn this uh, you know very carefully because there are a lot of a lot of abstract con con uh, concepts involved and need a really judgmental assessment of, of where items should be classified. 
So we have this primary objective of classifying all the income and expenses from ex foreign exchanges in the same category as line items, right? As items that give rise to them. But if there is undue cost or effort in trying to categorize the foreign exchange differences like that, we'll have to, first of all, see whether foreign exchange differences cannot be classified to relevant categories without undue cost or effort, or whether they can be classified without, without undue cost or effort. If they cannot be classified without undue cost or effort, simple, you have to categorize all of these uh, foreign exchange differences in the operating category. But if these foreign exchange differences can be classified, now you have to do the work. You have to first see whether these foreign exchange differences arise from other liabilities like trade payables. If they do not arise from other liabilities, you can simply classify the uh, foreign exchange differences in the same category or in the same category as the item that would give rise to them. For example, as we just discussed when we started the discussion, if foreign exchange uh, differences arose from traceables, you have to classify them as operating activity. If they, the foreign exchange differences arose from investment in bonds, these differences would be classified as investing activity. And if these foreign exchange differences were arise as a result of issued bonds, which is financing activity, they have to be any exchange gain or loss would be classified in financing activity. Because we because this is the option where we can classify it without undue cost or effort. But even then, if if these ex foreign exchange differences arose from other liabilities like trade payables, we have to look at whether the entity can determine uh, the foreign exchange differences related to the amount classified in financing category or the amount classified in operating category without undue cost or effort because there might be some interest involved and so there might be a breakup needed. If that breakup can be made without undue cost and effort, you have to classify it between operating category and financing category. But if that breakup cannot be made without undue cost or effort, again, simple, you will have to classify all of these foreign exchange differences into operating category. So quite a bit of assessments and quite a bit of decision trees here when classifying income expenses. And please note that we are not going through all the small categories of income expenses. We are just de dealing here some broad and big changes uh, in this webinar. So make sure to give, a, give it a read, read yourself, research on it. And if you need any advice, please come to us. Uh, we, we can help you implement IFRS 18. We can help you prepare for it in advance. We can help you make all the assessment required to comply with IFRS 18. Now we have explicit permission to present an analysis on a mixed basis. This was not there in IS1. So we talked about the possible way of structuring the income statement. This could be by nature, by function, or a mixture. And so under IFRS 18, we are now allowed to structure it in any of these forms, provided that it provides the most useful structured summary. So an income statement by may be classified by nature, maybe uh, you know prepared by function, or maybe prepared on a mixed basis. Whatever basis provides the most useful structure summary to tell the story to your investors. All right. Now, if any of the operating expenses, this is interesting, uh, this is an additional disclosure that's explicitly required by IFRS 18. If any of the ex operating expenses are presented by function on the face of income statements, uh, you will need to disclose the nature-wise details in a single note for each of the five specific nat nature expenses. So let's say you are presenting uh, your income statement by function, or on mixed basis, which means there would be some line items that would be grouped or aggregated on the basis of function. Let's say there would be 
admin expenses or they would be cost of sales. And those are functional items, not, not based on nature. So if you have presented any of those items in your income statement, you would have to provide a note to tell us or to tell the users of the final statements, how much of the deposition is there? How much of, of amortization is there in that particular expense? How much employee benefits are there? How much impayment losses are there? How much write down or reversals of investments are there? So all these different nature of expenses, which means if you provide it by function, you would also have to break it by nature in the notes, right? To avoid any ambiguity as to what's going on really, where all the expenses are coming from. And when we break it up by nature, you have to provide the full information. So let's say for depreciation of, of property plan equipment, you have to, what do you have to tell about depreciation? The total amount recognized and disclosed under the IFRS, right? The total amount of depreciation, you have to disclose that. For each total, the amount related to each line item in the operating category. So for which, so for example, you have depreciation uh, you might have depreciation uh, that is categorized in cost of sales. You might have depreciation that is categorized in admin expenses. So for each line item, you have to break that depreciation into how much of depreciation is, is included in each of those line items. And for each total, a list of any line items outside the operating category that also includes the amount related to the total. So if, for example, you, some of the deposition relates to investing category in some way. So you have to also disclose how much of the deposition is there in other categories like investing or financing categories. Here is a simple note showing the breakup based on nature. So let's say you have cost of sales and economic expenses and research and development expenses. So you also have to break it up into amortization, employee benefits, impairment losses, inventory write-downs, and depreciation. So this will enable users to understand the line items in a much better way. And now this is a mandatory disclosure required in the notes. All right, that was all from income statement. Now we'll have to move to management defined performance measures. Do we have some questions here? Uh, yes, Imad, I think uh, people might need a break. So thank you for the detailed discussion. Um, I had a few questions in the chat I've already answered, but again, I'd uh, like everyone to know. So when we were discussing uh, the type of investing activities, so this is a very general question for people who are working in uh, investment companies, like holding companies. So someone is asking that, what about holding companies? Uh, where will that income or expense be categorized? So they would want to know that, for example, where they have uh, SBUs who have different businesses and also has been investing in different financial instruments. Should this be classified as operating or investing income? This is very common question, especially in uh, different groups uh, in the UAE and the GCC. Uh, there are a lot of holding companies, investment companies and family groups and the main holding company on top of all the companies within the group. So this will become a challenge. I would like to know what is uh, your input on this question. True, uh, very true, Khushbu. Uh, again, for some companies, there might be a lot of con consideration that an assessment they will have to make. And so this is not non-trivial. This You cannot just say that this is, Another standard like IS1, and this is just a new name and the old standard. There are a lot of significant changes, which would, which should basically, if auditors understand what this says, <laughs> if auditors understand what this says, this standard should be able to improve financial reporting significantly. But let's say if auditors don't themselves understand what the changes are and they do not require their, their users to apply those changes, then we might not see as much uh, change in practice. For example, if auditors ignore the classification or categorization, of an aspect of income expense into investing in category or financing a category if, if there is ambiguity. If, for example, if they don't understand it themselves, uh, then we might not see that much of, a, of an impact. But I think you should be prepared for it in advance because, you know, as we grow, uh, as the standard, as new standards come, maybe for one or two years, everyone's trying to learn what's going on. And then 
when everyone understands you have to make those changes and if you have to make those changes in the future some of those changes might be because of your misunderstanding in the past because of your errors and so you might have to apply that retrospectively which would be uh, a really uh, you know a big feat to achieve so to 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 be to avoid all that we should all prepare in advance in about the requirements of hyper city Uh, yes, Amak, but uh, the question was regarding the holding company. So, can you tell us if uh, if the business is a holding company and they are only doing investments? So, where should they classify all the investments? Should it be an operating uh, business or activity, or it should be an investing activity? So, if it's a holding company and it's an investment company, which means it does not consolidate its. It's it's wholly owned subsidiaries. It only presents it on the final statement as an investment as fair value, or as investments, which means it has an exception. It has an um, is excluded from the scope of FIS three. In that case, its main act business activity would be investing activities, and so all the income expenses from those investment would go into operating category rather than investing category. Yeah, I had the same idea. Okay, one more question regarding the foreign exchange. So, what about the FX on loan provided to another entity? So, I'm assuming it's for a group entity, and it's an interest-based loan or maybe non-interest-based loan. They would want to know if we are providing a loan to an entity of our own, and uh, where should we classify that loan? And again, the foreign exchange on that loan will come into the same category. So, what category should that be? And it's not our day-to-day -day business to provide loans. Yeah. So if we are providing a loan to an entity, this is an investing activity, and so all the foreign exchange gains and losses should go into investing category. But that okay. So is it an investment investing activity or a financing activity? No. If we are obtaining finance, that would be an, a financing activity, it, because we are financing someone else. This is our investing activity and their financing activity. I hope we have given your answers, and I think okay, one answer I think we missed. So regarding the PNL presentation, someone was asking whether the comprehensive income statement will it be presented separately and not as an extension of the income statement? Yeah, Khushbu, we touched that as well. Um, both ways, you can do it separately or you can present a single statement. Okay, great. So let's move to MPMs. I think this will be an interesting topic for many people here. That most of our targets are linked to the MPMs. So let's cover it quickly because I think we are short of time. Sure, Khushbu. So management defined performance measures. Uh, they are not loosely defined in IFRS 18. They have a very specific meaning. First of all, there are two things that you need to note. These are subtotals. Of income and expenses. Uh, I, I I need to stress this again. There are subtotals of income and expenses. So, for example, if there are, you know, inventory turnover as a ratio, as a performance metrics, or let's say cons customer satisfaction ratios, those are not MPMs in accordance with IFRS 18. They might be reported uh, to public by the company as their performance measure, but an MPM in accordance with IFRS 18 is only a subtotal. Of income and expenses, and which subtotal? A subtotal that is used in public communications outside the financial statements. For example, in management commentary, press releases, investor in meetings, investor presentations. These are the subtotals of income and expenses that are frequently communicated to the public. Now, IFRS wants that this information should also be audited. These measures of performance, which are Subtotals of income and expenses, which means they are they relate to to information that have already been audited, right? And they are being communicated to the companies to to, to the investors uh, as their own performance. So we can bring that within the scope of the audited financial statements. So if you have you communicate some subtotals of income and expenses, just like Khushbu said, EBITDA, uh, they are used in public communications outside the financial statements, then. Uh, those are MPMs, and you have to communicate all those MPMs in a single note to the financial statements.
So here's a more technical definition of what MP and 3D are. Uh, these are subtle of income expenses that are used in communications after the final statements, communicate management's view of an aspect of the financial performance of the entity as a whole. So if you're not talking about some specific division or a specific category of the entity, uh, it should be the management's view of an aspect of the financial performance of the entity as a whole. And they are the subtotal of income and expenses, but are not a required subtotal. What do you mean by required subtotal? So let's say they are operating profit. All, all the revenue, less all the operating expenses would be operating profit. That operating profit is a required subtotal. We said there are five required subtotals, right? And there are this, there's a subtotal after investing activities and there's a subtotal after financing activities. So if there is a required subtotal, it has already been communicated in the income statement on the face of it. And so you do not need a separate note to disclose that. So all of those uh, MPMs, all, the, all of those performance measures that are within the income statement have been excluded from uh, the definition. So we should note, as we already discussed, that a lot of a lot of non-GAAP measures or KPIs are much broader than MPMs because they are they might not be the subtotal of income expenses. Let's say free cash flow. Free cash flow might be a, a measure communicated to public very frequently to tell the performance of the company, but free cash flows are not subtotals of income expenses, right? You can drive them by making adjustments, but these are not subtotals of income expenses. And therefore those uh, free cash flow is not an MPM. So to better understand what MPMs are, we should also understand what MPMs are not. So a subtotal of only income or expenses, for example, just revenue, cash paid, salary costs. So if let's say, <laughs> It's just a subtotal of income. It cannot be an MPM. If it's just a subtotal of expenses, then it cannot be an MPM. So it should be a subtotal of income and expenses. Similarly, any asset, liability, equity, or combination of these elements cannot be an MPM because this does not relate to income and expenses. It relates to balance sheet items. Financial ratios cannot be uh, MPMs, although they might be key performance indicators. They might be you know, non-GAAP measures, but they cannot be MPMs. Similarly, if those measures are non-financial performance measures, let's say your subscribers, if you're if you're a SaaS company, your subscribers increase from 5,000 to 25,000, this is a great uh, measure of performance for you. This is probably the primary measure of performance for you and you disclose it publicly, and this is your probably KPI, this is your non-GAAP measure, but this is not your non-financial, this is not your MPM. This, this is not your MPM within the definition of IPS 18, and this does not need a disclosure in a single note. Now, the question is, where should the management defined performance measure be disclosed? Um, typically, uh, for in most companies, it should always be be uh, disclosed in a single note. But in certain circumstances, MPMs can be presented on the face of income statement. Now, remember, these MPMs can only be presented on the face if they are compatible with a useful structure summary, right? If you have to do go back and do some reverse calculations and do some uh, additional adjustments and then provide it would give a lot of prominence to things that are not relevant. And this would destroy the purpose of income statement, providing a useful structure summary of the income expenses. So only if it falls and fits in place uh, while providing a useful structured summary of income statement, then you can report or present MPM on the income statement itself. So here's a uh, what IFRS 18 requires when talking about presenting MPMs on income statement. Now, it can be presented as an additional subtotal only if that subtotal is comprised of amounts recognized and measured in accordance with IFRS counting standards. It's compatible with income statement structure to provide a useful structure summary displayed with no more prominence than required subtotals and totals. 
and labeled in a way that is not misleading. So if all of these conditions are fulfilled, only then you can present MPM on the face of your financial statement, on the face of income statement. Otherwise, uh, obviously all the MPMs would be uh, communicated in a single note. Now, all the a subtotal or or any or any subtotal of income and expenses that is used in public communication outside the financial statements will generally be a management's view of performance. So if you're communicating any subtotal of income and expenses to your investors, it will be assumed that those are your MPMs and you will have to disclose this. If you don't want that assumption to hold true, you will have to rebut that presumption with reasonable and supportable information. Now, what the rebuttal should look like, you can rebut the presumption if you have reasonable support information which, dem which fulfills both the following conditions. First of all, you have to show that the subtotal does not communicate your view as a management of an aspect of the entity's financial performance as a whole. So, and the entity has a reason for using the debt subtotal in its public communications other than communicating management's view of aspects of an entity's financial performance. For example, your law or your your government requires you to communicate certain measures and you don't think though those are your view or management's view of uh, of the entity's performance as a whole, then they are not considered your MPMs, even though you report them, even though they are your subtotal of your income statements. But in your final statement, you do not need to disclose how and where and when you have rebutted the presumption that certain subtotals are not your performance measures. Now, this is a quick summary of what to disclose uh, and how to disclose it. First, you have to say that MPM, you have to describe what MPMs are because not all the users of the final statement would be aware of the changes and would not know what these are. So you have to first of all, tell them what the MPMs are. And you have to tell them that MPMs are your management's view of an aspect of final statements, final performance of the entity as a whole and not just an aspect of it. And MPMs are not necessarily comparable with other entities uh, measure that share similar labels or descriptions. So your MPMs might not be comparable with other entities is a very important point. You have to tell them, you have to tell the users of your final statements straightforward. This is your view, your adjusted number, your subtotal, and this subtotal might not be the same as some other company's subtotal who might be using the same label, by the way. And then you have to describe uh, the aspect of final performance that is in management view is communicated by the MPM. So if you have um, a, a certain MPM disclosed, you should also tell them what it means in the context of that business, in the, in the context of your company, uh, and why the MPM is useful to judge or assess the entity's performance and how you calculated that. Now, this should give en enough context to your user to understand what MPMs you are communicating. Now, once all of that is done, you can come to the numbers. You have to reconcile between the MPM and the most directly comparable common subtotal listed in IFRS 18 or subtotal required to be presented by other IFRSs, which means you now have to uh, reconcile your MPM to some subtotal that is presented in the income statement. And that reconciliation should show all the differences between what your performance measure was, how you were assessing it, and what the other items are. Now, when you're reconciling them, you should also disclose the amounts related to each line item in income statement and how the reconciling item is calculated and contributes to MPM providing useful information. So basically, uh, the purpose is to bring MPM within the ambit of audit to allow the management to provide its own view of, of, of performance of the entity as a whole, the, the way it does it outside audit file statements, and to explain the user of file statement that they are not compatible with other companies and what they mean and how they have been calculated and how they relate to items in the income statement. Here is a simple presentation of how something might relate to how an MPM can be reconciled to a subtotal 
So we have an adjusted, adjusted operating profit. For example, you might have the adjustment by bringing out all the non-recurring items to, to, tell you, to tell the users what is the recurring profit, what, is, what they should expect based on adjusted operating profit, and then let's say restructuring cost, which might be one of cost, and then the operating profit, which is the sum of the two. For each of the items presented in the reconciliation, you also have to show the tax effects and the effects of non on non-controlling interest. And that was it for all the NP NPMs. I hope this was an effective and useful session. I try to keep it simple, keep all the important points in there, and I hope you really enjoyed it there. Uh, any, any final questions if you have, please feel free to share it. Okay, I don't think they have any other questions. So uh, let's end the session. Uh, thank you everyone who was with us since the beginning. And uh, thank you, Imad, for a wonderful presentation. And I hope uh, we have uh, uh, collectively answered most of your questions. Again, the IFRS is new. It's not yet implemented. Uh, I don't think so anyone has adopted early uh, implementation. But um, whenever we do it, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions, a lot of adjustments and uh, discussions throughout. Uh, we are still going through a phase that uh, people are uh, creating, um, you know, bringing up different issues that what happens if we are doing this and what happens we, if we are presenting it this way. I think all the questions will be answered uh, with time once we are in the flow, like all the other IFRS we recently implemented, 15, 16, 9, so once they were implemented, uh, they, we had a lot of questions. All the clients were coming up different, with different scenarios. I believe this will be the same thing. Although the IFRS is not complex, but I think the only thing will be a lot of judgments and discussions uh, based on how to present it in the best way possible for both the management as well as uh, it'll be helpful for the stakeholders. So I think let's uh, uh, end the session. It was very delightful to be in discussion with all of you. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. And thank you, Imad. Uh, would you like to have some closing words? Uh, I think we should be prepared in advance for the standard when it comes, because often we have seen with IFRS 9, IFRS 17, there have been a lot of lag, a lot of problems. Later on, uh, we have seen a lot of companies in IFRS 9, for example, they implemented in in a hurry. They implemented in the wrong way. They were not, were not strategic about it, and they have to, you know, incur even additional costs because of it. They had to, you know, for example, implement it two or twice or thrice because they did not understand what they were doing. So it's important to be prepared for all the, these changes because in the future regulators are going to be more aware of this. Uh, artists are becoming more aware of this. There's more awareness. There are more material available, and so you should prepare as as a company for all the changes in advance. You should train your staff. You should be ready. Should we understand uh, how this would affect your data and systems if it would, and how should uh, how you should uh, adjust your accounting manuals as you as uh, we have a question as well. If you have to, you know, make certain assessment in advance, you have to do that. If you have to uh, make some some tweaks to your current accounting processes or FRCPs, you have to understand that. And so once it's all in place, you will be much in a, in a much easier position when the the uh, IFRS becomes applicable. Um, really, thank you for all all this attention, all, all the questions. We really appreciate your questions. Thank you for being a part of this webinar. Have a great day. Thank you, and we'll be back with something more interesting soon. Take care. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Bye-bye.